Lunch. I'm Nisha Podar and with me as always is my co-anchor Pavitra Parekh. So it's a good day of trade yeah. today. In <laughs> fact, this week is also reflecting festive cheer really which is coming in uh, just ahead of Diwali. So over 1% up on Nifty 50 at the moment. Kissing distance from 17,500 level, a level that it had conquered earlier in the day. So second day on the trot and a good day uh, in trade. Bank Nifty is the one which is also again uh, showing out performance to the key indices and revving up the overall market sentiment. When it comes to the mid cap, it has shown slight bit of underperformance, but one can't ask too much because it's still up by 0.84%. And that's also the reason of broad-based participation that the advanced decline ratio, the market strength, is also looking extremely bullish at this particular point in time. State Bank of India is one big performer. It had been yesterday as well. But some of the other counters, like A HDFC Limited really attracts my attention on a very good day. It is showing a huge underperformance uh, to the overall market. But when it comes to the companies which are really giving huge amount of lift to the market, Reliance Industries, the big heavyweight ahead of its results, which is slotted on Friday, is re really doing extremely well along with the banking as well as IT counters. Pavitra. Well, absolutely. The festive cheer, like you said, is definitely showing through in our markets. And, you know, it's not just our own markets. Uh, the rest of Asia is also doing very well. So everything barring the Shanghai markets are doing well today. So some of those uh, indices are up on your screen. The Dow futures, by the way, up almost 400 points. So do keep that on your radar as well. This entire week, we've really seen the PSU banks push through today. It's up around 3%, more than 3% now, almost 4%. But uh, for the past five days, we've seen an over 7% move in the PSU. SU Bank Index. So that is the kind of strength that you're seeing there. Some of the FMCG stocks also doing well. But in the past few minutes, it is some of the financials, the likes of the Bajaj Twins, HDFC, which are under pressure. So we'll be watching out for that uh, throughout the show as well. But with that, let's move on and talk about our first top story. TVS Motor is one stock that we're looking at. It's powered through to a new 52-week high. This as some key brokerages turn bullish on the stock. So Sonia standing by at the wall with a complete deep dive into why the stock is really rallying so much. Sonia. Well, thanks a lot for that. So TVS Motors hit a fresh high today. The stock, in fact, is the strongest auto stock. It's up 74% in 2022, um, while the Nifty Auto Index is up just about 14% this year. So there's a clear outperformance that we've seen. Now, TVS Motor is the only two-wheeler maker to substantially expand its presence in all high-growth categories over the past decade, and hence the outperformance in the stock. So we decided to do a deep dive and take a look at the market share gains that TVS has seen over the last eight years in several categories. Let's start with the premium motorcycle segment, the 150 to 250 cc segment. TVS Motors market share has risen from just 12.3% way back in FY15 all the way to almost 26% in FY22. Now, this market share gain in the premium motorcycle segment was led by a very strong performance by the Apache brand. And TVS last year also launched the Apache RTR 160, which has seen a great response. Let's move on now to the scooter segment where they're not too far behind in terms of gains. Way back in FY15, they had just 15.2% market share and now it's at 20% due to the success of two of their brands, the TVS Jupiter and the NTOC. Of course, they've gained quite a bit of ground in uh, the electric vehicle space and in the export market as well. So let's take a look at the export market motorcycle share. Now that was just 13% of the industry exports came from TVS Motor way back in FY15. That has gone up all the way to 25.1%. And, uh, you know, that just goes to show that, you know, the margins are higher in the export market and hence realizations for TVS has picked up as well. And that has helped with the overall um, margin picture coming in at 9 to 10% plus. But how are the valuations stacked up, you would ask? It's not too expensive compared to its five-year average. So TVS Motor currently trades at about 29.4 times FY24 and the last five-year average is 28 times and hence perhaps the stock is continue to uh, continues to gain ground. Back to you. 
All right, Sonia, thanks so much for getting us all the details and the deep dive on TVS Motor. Another stock on our radar today, in fact, stock in news today is the entertainment. Take a look at that particular counter, maintaining that 3.5% gain at the moment. In fact, take a look at the five-day chart as well. Lot has happened over the last two weeks in terms of getting the necessary approvals for the Sony merger to get through. And uh, the kind of depression in the stock uh, performance, despite the approvals coming in, was because of the impending block deal that the market was expecting. So let's talk about that big block deal in Z Entertainment earlier today with OFI Global likely to have sold 5.5% stake in the company and Nimesha, my colleague who's tracking it very, very closely, joins in with all the details of this and also the timelines of this merger process. Nimesh. In today's trade, and not surprising, you know, the couple of reasons why the stock is doing good today. One, uh, the blo entire block of 5.5% from Invesco uh, happened in a block window, so it, it, there was absolutely no slippage in the block. I still don't have the color on the book, which means I, I mean there, there are not enough details on who the buyers are, and that will be the next next important thing to watch out for. Maybe the disclosure will come today evening, so that's something to watch out. The other reason why the stock is doing well today is the fact that now there is a 180 days of lockup for Invesco. See, Invesco was holding 10.5% and 10.1.5% uh, uh, and they were sold 5.5. So they left with 5%, but this 5% can only come now after six months. So there could be no further supply. And in the six months, there is a very high possibility that, uh, that the new entity will get listed on the exchanges. Post that, uh, any which way the Invesco stake will further slow, go down because the equity base is going up. So, you know, there is now no, no further supply coming in uh, from Invesco, at least for the next six months. And the fact that the, the block happened in the block window is leading to a big surge uh, in, in Z Entertainment today. As I said, uh, the disclosure in terms of buyers will be important. I don't have a color yet. But the, uh, two big reasons why the stock is up today. One, it happened in a block window, the fact that now there is a lockup for 180 days for Invesco. All right, Namesh, thanks a lot for getting us the latest on Z and all of the details of this block deal. But with that, let's move on and talk about Adani Transmission, which is also rallying after a strong operational update for the second quarter. It's up almost 4%, so Vivek is standing by to take us through all of the highlights. Vivek. Well, that's right. So Adani uh, Transmission actually went ahead and gave an operational update for the quarter gone by to the exchanges. Uh, so now when you're looking at the internal of this particular update, you know, it's quite a strong operational performance that the company has managed to deliver. Now remember the company operates both in the transmission as well as the distribution segment. And when you're talking about the transmission business, the operated transmission lines were northwards of 99.7%, so a strong number coming in there. Very interestingly, when you're talking about the distribution business, the distribution utility business actually has gone up almost 13% on a year-on-year -year basis. So another strong number coming in there and more importantly when you're talking about the distribution loss which a lot of the distribution companies actually face Adani has actually managed to go ahead and reduce or minimize this particular loss to around 6% in Q2 FY23 versus 7.6% last year around so on the back of these improved metrics you're actually seeing the stock do quite well in today's trading session all right, Vivek, thanks so much for all the details coming in on Adani Transmission. Let's focus on another counter which is on our radar today for news. Well, Vmart is uh, also trading higher after acquiring e-commerce startup Lime Road for 31 crore rupees. Small amount, but big potential with this acquisition. And we caught up with the founder and MD of the company, Lalit Agarwal, to really understand the contours of the deal and what prospects it presents to the company. Take a listen. This is definitely uh, a very good uh, acquisition that we have had, and this is a great team. Lime Road, uh, which is which was run by Suchi, so actually the founder, Suchi Mukherjee. Slowly and gradually, this millennial crowd is definitely going to acquire more and more digitalization, and that's where we are getting prepared for. And that is why we took up this opportunity. And this is a great team, which which has a great technology, and we could really build onto that. But yeah, uh, as, as far as revenue is concerned, they had a very good peak pre-COVID and post-pre-COVID, post -COVID, they have gone a little bit down and they have they have uh, suffered. But as of now, it, it, it has a 10 crore plus uh, run rate per month. But yeah, I think I think we will we'll definitely scale it up immediately uh, within the next 12 months to the pre-COVID levels. There is a loss which is uh, which is small right now, but I think we could with with the expertise at Vmart, the product expertise at Vmart, the qualities that we can offer, and the kind of deliveries that we could offer from our stores, which are to a four hundred and ten doors as of now, where the customer delivery could be much cheaper and much faster. That's the opportunity that we'll try to use and make this system efficient. And that's the 
uh, the real omni piece which will come in and could become efficient and, and profitable in the next two years. All right, that is the management of WeMark talking about their acquisition of Lime Road. But in fact, the management also highlighted a slowdown in rural demand, something which was then echoed by the management of Parley, who said that rural demand has slowed in September. But the good part is that we could see a pickup because we have seen a good monsoon as well. So let's listen in to those comments. From rural market, we've seen that this is sort of slowed down. Particularly in September, actually, we've seen fantastic June, July, and August. But September seems to have sl uh, slowed down. So that's that's only a, a bit of concern. But actually, we are past two weeks in October, and we are really seeing a, a good trend uh, get, getting picked up uh, during October as well. And uh, we are quite hopeful. Uh, rural uh, definitely is, uh, to an extent, struggling. But uh, we are quite optimistic with that uh, we've had a fantastic season in terms of the monsoons. And uh, we are quite upbeat that even uh, rural would start reciprocating uh, uh, good enough uh, in the coming times. All right. Rural demand has seen some slowdown, but festive pickup is expected. I will pencil that in as one of the macro factors, important ones to really watch out for going forward. Now, on that note, we'll uh, slip into a short breather on business lunch, but in a bit to really appease the markets, the new British finance minister scraps almost all the planned tax cuts that were part of Liz Trust's mini-budget. Hey guys, welcome back. You're still tuned into Business Lunch. Now, Pyramal Enterprises, the stock went ex the pharma business on the 30th of August. So, Pyramal Pharma now, which is the pharma business, is all set to list separately. Ekta is here with some more details and to tell us about this company. Ekta. Thanks for that. Well, yes, Pyramal Pharma, the entity, has three verticals. The contract development and manufacturing, or the CDMO arm, which is majority of the business, entails drug di discovery, development, and commercial manufacturing. The other two verticals are complex hospital generics, which contains inhalation, anesthesia, and injectables, and the India consumer healthcare arm, which houses brands such as Ceridon, Lactocalamine, and Ipil. Now, a few key points to keep in mind. The company has a strong regulatory track record. It has completed a total of 280 regulatory inspections with 36 US FDA inspections which have gone off successfully. Pyramal Pharma gets around 41% of its sales from North America. Pyramal also has a strong presence in the anesthesia market, a business which is categorized by lower competition and higher barriers of entry, while growth of the company's OTC arm is also keenly watched as it grew 48% year-on-year in FY22. A few factors to watch out for. A pickup in the CDMO business, which has been impacted by execution-related challenges. And while the company withheld FI23 guidance due to volatility and their ability to meet long-term guidance and re-entering the domestic formulation space, growth drivers include factors such as addressing those execution challenges in the short term and a recovery in the second half and the possible China plus one factor in a larger and longer term perspective. Now, the market cap of the pharma entity is expected to be anywhere between 24 to 25,000 crores, which is a premium to the 18,000 crore valuation it had been given in 2020 when Carlyle bought around 20% stake for 3,700 crores, which was one of the largest PE deals in the pharma space. In terms of listing price, Access Cap had in their note at the time of the X date indicated that the post demerger value is around 190 rupees for pyramid pharma with an equity value of around 22,700 crores. CLSC expects the share value at around 206 rupees per share with a price to book value of around 0.8 times. This note too came out a couple of months ago when the demerger took place. All right, Ekta, thanks so much for getting us all those details. It marks a very important milestone in the entire Peramwell uh, group structure and succession planning as well. All right, uh, there were flashes on your screen. In fact, State Bank of India, the largest uh, bank in the country, has increased the savings deposits interest rate. Remember, we are in an interest rate tightening scenario where all the interest rates, uh, when it comes to well, the consumption, had been raised over time, but uh, this could be the first instance of uh, the interest rate hike on the savings deposits rate as well. So uh, good news coming in for the savings deposit holders of uh, State Bank of India and more are expected to follow. 
All right, moving on to some international development then to the big queue from the UK where Jeremy Hunt, remember, the new British finance minister scrapped almost all the planned tax cuts announced in the trust government's mini budget last month. Now, the move sought to soothe the markets that saw a broad-based sell-off after Hunt's predecessor, Kwasi Kwarteng, had announced this historic unfunded tax cuts. However, trust's U-turn are similar to the plans that were, remember, proposed by Rishi Sonak and my colleague Sanjay Suri wraps up all the action for us from London on this policy front and its impact. There's an expression we hear again and again these days in media, in politics, is the expression screeching U-turn to describe what Liz Truss began to do and that is now being undone and that was undone right across the board on Monday after the undoing bit by bit earlier. And nobody is missing the underlying fact here that Liz Truss has been turning away from her own policies, of course, that we see, but she is turning more and more to adopt those of Rishi Sunak. This is what everyone is saying, even if the Conservative Party leaders and the Trust government obviously is not saying it. And she is doing this without acknowledging this. These U-turns she's been making are not over some minor policy issues. These are over tax cuts and those defined her whole campaign for the post of PM. They were at the heart of the debate with Rishi Sunak. And this debate was repeated at hustings after hustings. Rishi Sunak had argued all through that these tax cuts as proposed by trusts would be ruinous. He had argued that children and grandchildren would have to pay off the debt that these would bring on. But there perhaps he may have made an error. The boomerang did not need generations. It came in days and ended in three weeks. All right, Sanjay, thanks a lot for getting us all of the details on the UK tax cuts. But with that, we're going to get into another short break in the show. When we come back, the 12th edition of the Defence Expo is currently underway in Gandhinagar, Gujarat, with over 1,300 Indian companies showcasing their innovation. So we'll get you all of the details when we come back. Welcome back. You're watching Business Lunch and a quick look at the market. Stable gains on Nifty 50 still holding on to the levels. But two pockets which have seen some bit of uh, profit booking in the last half an hour of trade are the consumption as well as the auto space. So there has been some profit booking in these two counters, these two pockets uh, like Britannia, HUL, Tata Consumer. And on the auto side, it's Hero Moto, Bajaj Auto. They have lost ground and at the low point of the day. Shifting focus to some news uh, flow today, then coming in from the defense space. Well, India is hosting the 12th edition of the defense exhibition Def Expo 2022 in Gandhinagar starting today. And CNN News 18 Sakash Sharma is standing by at the venue to take us through what's lined up at the exhibition in terms of participants, companies, as well as equipment. Defense Expo 2022. The 12th edition of the flagship event of the Defence Ministry that has been organised here in Gandhinagar area. The five days event is going to showcase India's indigenous platforms, weapons, ammunition and different equipments related to defence manufacturing industry. This is a five days programme where the initial three days are going to be business specific and the rest two days will be open for public. As of now, Indian companies are taking part in this particular event and we have, we have been told that more than 1,000 plus companies are going to take part. On the very first day, we have bilateral talks with Africa and not just Africa, but Indian Ocean region countries are also taking part in this particular event. Tomorrow, on 19th of October, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is going to be a part of this event and on a daily basis, we are going to see drone shows at the riverfront of Sabarmati. At this point in time, this is happening after a long wait of two years. And Path to Pride is the theme of this defense expo that has been organized in Gandhinagar area of Gujarat. This is going to show the world that how India is emerging as a hub of defense manufacturing units and now India is on the path of Atmanirbharta. We are focusing on our indigenous platforms 
and that's the reason why we have seen in number of months in the past that we have developed our own tejas we have developed our own prachand and a lot many indigenous platforms that have been launched in the recent months as of now this 5 days event is going to be concluded on 22nd of october and everyone and is anticipating a number of people that are going to take part in this particular event that has more than 1000 exhibitors in it akash thanks a lot for getting us all of the highlights from the defense expo which is underway but on that note we're going to wind down with the market in fine fettle it's a 1% move on the nifty and the nifty bank is really powering uh, the, the the session today with a move of over 450 points so thanks a lot for tuning into business lunch mid cap radar is up next